right, my friends, we are back on another live stream with Don Dunn from HD 2020. What's How you up, doing, everybody? Jackson? Jackson! Jackson! Thanks. Merry Christmas, Gargamel. my friends. We're Gargamel. almost there. Gargamel. 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 This is his buffering. All right. Enough of, that. enough of that geeky stuff. <laughs> so, Don. Yes, sir. You know, I think we should talk about something that I don't see anyone talking on YouTube about. You know, all the YouTubers are gushing over Klipsch and gushing over the, the standard brands and gushing over their listening tests that they do on YouTube, but they don't talk about distributed audio. They don't talk about getting high resolution audio throughout the whole house, inside, outside, backyard, front yard. I want to go over the kind of integrator stuff that you bring to the table. Since sure. you've been doing this for like 30 years. Man, You're not that old, right? Not that old, no. Started very young. Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, it's interesting because we come from different backgrounds, but we come from a lot of common ground from the sure. beginning. Sure. You and I have seen this industry evolve over the years. We both were, we were huge on Circuit City, you know, the big Oculus flagship receivers. Mm -hmm. And when I built my first house, the Audio Hulk's uh, showcase house. Um, I wanted distributed audio, but there weren't a lot of these really slick solutions that you have today. So what I would do is I would use every zone of my receiver and I would use speaker selector switches, you know, and I would just have all the audio going through the house. If I had two or three independent zones, I was happy. I was like, oh my God, this is incredible. And that's what I did. When you came over, when I first met you, you came over to my house and I was using a Yamaha RX Z7 receiver and I had all three zones supported and I was doing about maybe eight speakers throughout the house using right. switch boxes. That's where, right. that's where you came into the picture. Correct. You know, back in the early 90s, way back in the 90s, when we were doing, just starting to do custom installation, there was a few companies here and there doing some really cool stuff. But we had kind of a limited amount of equipment to work from. I know that I worked at a company called Sound Advice here in Florida, which was a pro group retailer that dabbled in custom. They did some stuff. But back then, we did most everything with Niles. There was just a few companies. And Niles was, at least in Florida, was the king of the distributed audio. Little little various pieces to automate. Little sensing amplifiers that would sense a signal, turn mm -hmm. themselves on, and turn audio on. So we would do... Um, a distributed audio system might be a surround sound receiver in a main room, then a secondary stereo receiver that would then run to um, a speaker selector box. And so it, it was either a four six or eight zone. I think they made them quite larger. I think Niles even made a 10 or 12, <clears throat> but we would do that. Then we would go to volume controls because it was just one source or one zone. And then I'll explain what a zone is. So in case you don't know, Mm -hmm. and, and then we would we would have distributed audio that way. Uh, we would have some end ceiling speakers, Niles or B and Ws or whatever brand. It's kind of limited back then compared to now. Speakercraft was a kind of an innovator in that, and and that was distributed audio. If and those uh, speaker selector boxes were notorious for robbing power from from the system. I mean, they just, just didn't sound that good. And yeah. you're very little power. It was stepped on. It was it was run through this. In case people don't know, a, a, a speaker selector or impedance matching speaker selector would take a left and right stereo pair, run into it, and then it would have outputs to go out to, to various amounts of speakers and a button to turn it off and on. What that would do is create a, a, a consistent um, load back to the receiver, whereas obviously you couldn't take a receiver and drop it into two ohms or whatever crazy mm -hmm. ohms that would work out to be. Um, so it would allow you to do that reliably and, and it would last a, a pretty good amount of time. And that's a good point that you bring up. Cause I just recently saw another YouTube channel where this guy was gushing over a hundred dollar Sony receiver, which is a great value for what it is. He's like, hook up two pairs of speakers at the same time and you could rock your whole house. I'm like, really? You can't really do that if you understand physics, because this thing cannot drive a forum load continuously. You're going to basically kill the longevity of the product going to overheat i'm sure you've seen this in the field where people have tried to do just that with, with a wimpy receiver and try to parallel a bunch of speakers to it what has happened to you when you've seen that have you seen receivers blow out <laughs> yeah that's what happened <clears throat> there's only so much you can do and of course different amps are 
are a little more durable. You know, your cheap Sony receivers that you find at Best Buy or, or online, they're, they're just not built for that. I mean, it did, so distributed audio was just background music. You're hanging out by the pool. You just got a little bit of music playing. Um, you're hanging out in another room. You got a little bit of music playing. And the sources weren't all that great. I mean, of course, you had CD back then, you know, which had a pretty good resolution. To, but the products were just weren't there. It was at the early infancy of, of automation and distributed audio. So that's kind of how we did things. Then receivers started coming out subsequently with Zone 2 and then eventually Zone 3 and Zone 37, whatever. And th those are fine. They, they were always a little quirky in operation, though. The way they would work then, if you had your receiver in the family room, you could turn on Zone 2. How's that, honey? And, and go back and do that. Now mm -hmm. they have apps and various things that, that, that overcome that. But we would run IR repeaters and extenders back um, so, so you know people could actually do that. So, I mean, it's changed considerably. If you Now, if you have a home and you have a surround receiver, they pack these things with everything. Yeah. I'm more curious, like you and I were talking about. I prefer a, a surround receiver to have great processing and DACs in it, um, really strong amplification, and good video switching. All the other bells and whistles as an integrator, we never use. And I don't think tons of people use them. They're just quirky. You know, you're going to want some kind of control system on your system. <clears throat> whether it be something like an RTI, a Harmony, um, or a Control 4, Crestron, whatever type system that you're going to have control it, you just want convenience and simplicity. And then the more things you put in these receivers, they just never use them. In fact, the Sony ES receivers that we use, they've taken a lot of these um, features out. So it's made it much simpler for integrators like ourselves. Yeah, actually, the new ES line of receivers are really solid. I mean, they offer good amplification. They don't throw a lot of junk into it, like you said. And if you want a straight up seven channel or nine channel Atmos receiver with good amplification, those are really they hit the price points right. Yeah. yeah. Well, when Sony wants to kick ass, Sony kicks ass. I mean, yeah, Sony. I mean, they've made some extraordinary audio products sporadically throughout the years. Remember that uh, five thousand preamp we, we talked about. 9,000, yeah, 9,000 9, ES. Yeah. Yeah. I had that with an M&K, full M&K THX uh, surround yeah. setup with a Rotel amp. That thing rocked. I mean, you remember their first awesome. reference? You remember the first reference uh, DVD player that had uh, that had seven thousand? That had incredible uh, CD quality. I nine ninety nine. Yeah, nine ninety nine. Yeah, I, and, and the I little had, tray came down, pulled yeah, it out. Yeah, dude, it was killer. I mean, the yeah. first Blu-ray player that we ever had was. Um, a Panasonic, but our Blu-ray <laughs> DVD player. DVD player, oh, yeah. I used to sell VCRs. I remember at Circuit City watching these videos of, of DVD, the future. I'm like, oh, I can't wait till this comes out. I mean, it's crazy to think that far back. But yeah, Sony and, and SACD players, when Sony wants to do it, they just do it. I mean, yeah. however, that's not necessarily their market. The mass market is cheap receivers and Walkmans and, and, and really great televisions. So that's just something they don't put a lot of effort into. Uh, but when they do, they do it right. Yep. So I want to share a screen here and we could kind of go over um, the evolution of distributed audio that we're talking about. Let me. Uh, so so sometime in the, the late mid to, to late 90s, companies were coming out with um, all in one ample distributed audio units like Rust Sound in particular. Um, Speakercraft and several other companies came out with these amplifiers and they would be a four zone. And so a zone is an area that will play it's an independent source. It'll play its own signal. Um, uh, so if you have two zones, in theory, you can have two separate things playing in each zone. And a zone doesn't necessarily need to be one pair of speakers. A zone can have four pair of speakers. Hell, a zone can have you know, 50 pair of speakers if it's 70 volt. So that's right. kind of what a zone is. But they would bring these amplifiers out and they would give you 25, 35, you know, 45 watts. They would run a little bit warm, but they would give you a, a one step simple solution. Now you can control it via remote and IR repeater, but a lot of them had these size of a, of a electrical switch and they would have volume up, volume down, mute, source and and it was really cool and then you would put some back uh in, in ceiling or in wall speakers and our outdoor speakers 
and you had pretty decent sound because the source would go right to that amp and then that amp would play those those particular speakers so that was kind of an evolution and we did that for many many years did they work good they worked okay some worked better than others like anything <clears throat> um you know we had one that was kind of a turd custom with a k made one that didn't work so well but you know for the most part they worked really really well and about that same time or subsequently after that is when mp3 and ipods and all these various compressed audio files kind of came into play and revolutionized the way we listen to music so what we did is we compressed the sound and we wound up taking really good sound and, and making it not so good but it was convenient and people were cool with that so right. you know well the one interesting thing is receivers have really I always thought they were going to eventually drop the multi-zone features and receivers because there's such good control systems now like triad and and control four that do this stuff better but yet the receivers hunkered down and they really developed each company developed their own apps so you have like denon and morantz has the heos music management system with with their own kind of yeah, uh we call those ecosystems. Ecosystem. yeah ecosystems right you know where he and heos is i think the design and the the what Denon had in mind was to have, have a higher resolution, better sounding version of Sonos because yep. Sonos kind of re revolutionized um, that, that particular thing. Now it's a Sonos controller. We use those for a long time that would actually um, hook into a receiver or to distributed audio system. And at some point in the past, we use those with control four and it, it's just a great solution. And it, and it allows you to use all your apps to stream music as well as hook in, um, an auxiliary source like a CD player or, you know, something in the, of that nature to play it. Um, Sonos really is, is they've become the new bows is what I tell everybody. Right. You know, people love, you know, like the Apple iPhone. People just are loyal to them. They love having the convenience. Their friends come over. They can jump on and they can share their playlist. Um, and it's a simple solution. They have powered speakers like you're showing here, which yeah. sound okay. I mean, if, you know, to most people, oh, that sounds great. You know, it's it's, it's the point of reference, you know. Yeah. Um, exactly. And they have amplifiers, um, and they've they've actually got a new generation of amps that aren't half bad, and they will actually allow us to integrate and play with a system like Control Four or a Savant or a Crestron or RTI. But they also have their own their own ecosystem and their own app that they can use. They're not bad. Now, Mucas is a system that Yamaha has, and they've had it for a while. And it has powered speakers, amplifiers, um, you know, distributed audio, sound bars. It's a really cool system, but I don't think it's ever really taken hold. Um, you know, it, it. I think, my, in my personal opinion, I like the way it works. I like the way it sounds. They're I do little, like MusicCast a lot. I've, I have really, it in the, yeah, I have it in the CX fifty two hundred uh, processor. Right, and it's just it, the interface is real easy to use. It's like you said, it's intuitive and. Um, the fact that they have all these different wireless products around it but a, as good as this is it's still not a system that integrates well with with a third-party control system right like you don't really control music cast through control four no we really don't um you know our, our clients when they come to an integrator they pay us for convenience i mean they pay us for a multitude of reasons they they want the 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 AV to an automation to kind of blend in with their lifestyle, blend in with the aesthetics of the house, but really convenience is the, is the key. So what we do as integrators, hence the word integrate is we take multiple systems from security to um, audio, to video, distributed video, heating and air conditioning, uh, surveillance, uh, you know, your, your ether, your Wi-Fi and your ethernet. And we integrate all these systems, water sprinklers, you name it into one, control system to rule them all each product has its own app but instead of a, a table full of remotes like we always used to have now we have a phone or device full of apps so we have to close one open the other one we want to make a change we got to hit our password or have our face recognition on it whereas you open a like i say control four because that's the product we use and that's what you have it brings all those under one umbrella so if you want to change the volume on your music turn the tv to a channel to be in the background Look at your camera out front, uh, unlock a door so somebody can come in your house. You can do all that from one app in, in a short amount of time. <clears throat> now, what you're showing here is uh, one of the latest generation of distributed audio products. Uh, Control 4 purchased Triad, which was always known for their 
really high output, high quality speakers. And they've made some incredible electronics. This is a um, eight zone. So it's a 16 channel or amplifier. Mm -hmm. And it's 50 watts a channel in the eight ohms. And it's 100 watts a channel in the four ohms. It uses an ICE module. So it's class D. And it sounds pretty darn good. It's, it has a great signal noise ratio. It's a high resolution amp. Um, it's, you know, we've with Tidal and Cobuzz and Apple Lossless and these new high resolution streaming sources, the amplifiers like this have really allowed us to take advantage of that and deliver more than just background music, enjoyable music. It sounds good at low volumes, which is really important. But if you, you know, get a couple martinis in you and you're, you're cool and you want to crank it up, it, it really it stretches its legs pretty good. Um, well, I could I could personally attest because I use this amp on a pair of the Sonance um, Voyager, I think eighty twos or whatever the model is on that speaker, um, the eight inch two ways, you know, the Sonance speakers. So we actually bridge two channels, so that fifty watts at eight right. ohms now becomes a hundred watts at eight ohms, right. two hundred watts at four ohms, depending clean. on the yeah. and clean. Yeah, very, and I've cranked the snot out of this amplifier, and I just didn't find the limit on those speakers in my yeah, giant those, those eight ohm. Yeah, well, you played those, you bridged those those big Sonances, those outdoors you just did a review of, yeah. and. I mean, those are phenomenal outdoor speakers. I mean, they're built to yep. military standards. Oh, I'm gonna be, I didn't post that review yet, so nobody's seen it oh, yet. But oh, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, they're, yeah, they're killer. I mean, when you played that for me and you kind of EQ'd it, because the Triad um, audio matrix, which goes with this, whether it's a, an 8x8 eight eight or a 24x24, 8x8 means 8 inputs or 8 outputs, and it's a matrix, so you could play input 1, on zone eight or input one on zone eight, six and five, or any combination of that, um, an eight by eight or a 24 by 24. And we actually use the 24 by 24 on, I do a lot of big homes and a lot of uh, big commercial, high end integrate, uh, integrated audio systems and commercials are commercial property. So we do take advantage of, of that. Yeah, well, here's, here's what I want people to realize. If you're trying to do this many channels of amplification for high resolution audio throughout the house, short of getting something like this, you're going to have to wind up getting some pretty big hefty amplifiers to be able to put out that much power if they're not class D. Then you're going to have a lot of, you're going to have to deal with a lot of heat distribution issues because you put three or four amplifiers in a rack, it's going to be a space heater. You're going to have to put some forced cooling in there. But with, with this triad, and, and not only triad, Martin Logan has their own. I have yeah, right we here. actually started using the Martin Logan amps quite a bit. Um, they're just a phenomenal product. I think Anthem, is that the parent? Yeah. It's the same as the Anthem. So the Martin yeah. Logan actually has uh, similar power. Um, you know, I, I think it sounds a little better. Plus, it's got Arc built into it. Yep. Um, and now this, the difference is the triad is just an amplifier. They make a... Um, eight zone which is 16 channels um or they make a four zone which is eight channels but it's just an amplifier and anything as far as equalization and whatnot is done from the triad matrix however with the martin logan amp it's what's called a matrix amp so it actually has inputs on it and you can add, it's a matrix and an amplifier combined into one chassis and martin logan um, and anthem make a four by four as well as an eight by eight great setup great system currently the favorite my favorite piece that i'm using for distributed audio it just has a really good sound quality to it and those are two martin logan's known as a phenomenal high-end speaker and, and sound company as well as anthem so you know it's it's a terrific product but i don't necessarily think for the integration market that's great um but you could also use this if you want to do it yourself i mean it it's a little more complex than setting up a Sonant system, but it's a way better sound and setup than you're going to find. And it's all in one chassis. If you, you would have to have eight separate amplifiers to do yeah. what this does and a matrix and a way to attune eight volume and a way to switch. So it's all in one chassis makes it great. And you add art to the mix. Now we can actually EQ each room, man. It, it's just a strong case for the best product out there in that particular class. Yeah, absolutely. And the cool thing about these class D amps is they actually double down uh, power with having load impedance. Unlike if you buy, a cheap, you buy a cheap little amplifier and you hope you're going to get double the power at forums, you usually don't. I just did a video on on that Sony hundred dollar receiver will collapse at four ohms. These so, things can yeah. these things can drive four ohms. Marketing wise, I kind of get on 
they're, you know, and, and episode does it in a lot of companies is they market it, you know, 16 times a hundred. Well, it's not, I mean, yeah. And yeah. four ohms, but most, most, um, in ceiling speakers are rated at eight ohms and they don't really dip a ton on their impedance. So, I mean, you know, the, don't say it's a hundred watt amp, say it because say it's a fifty watt amp. But uh, that's just a pet peeve to me. That, that that does annoy me too, because you know I'm all about yeah. truth and power. Oh yeah, yeah. It's just, but consumers consumers buy on spec. You know, the average person buys on spec, or he goes on and sees some pretty influencer who doesn't know what the hell he's talking about, telling him how great this thing sounds. You know, and and that's how people buy. Unfortunately. You know, that's why and I want people, I want people to realize something when, when you buy an amplifier, you buy a, um, I'm sorry, when you buy a speaker and it says eight ohms, that's a nominal yeah. average rating. If you look yeah. at an impedance curve, this is a very good speaker. We just reviewed this. Is, yeah. Those I, are killer speakers. Yeah. So you see this speaker goes down to five ohms and it, it goes down to five ohms in areas where you can consume a lot of power. Mm -hmm. So even like right here where that saddle point is, cause this is a tuned system. If you don't have a stout amplifier that can drive a five ohm load at volume, you're going to run into problems. And that's why it's important to know what an amplifier does at eight ohms and at four ohms, you know, right. so you have a wider diversity of speakers you can mate it with. So in distributed audio here in today's market, you have the do it yourself. If you just want a simple system, non receiver based system, most people that do the Sonos, do their sound bar, which sounds pretty decent for what it is, and their subwoofer, and they're content. And if you're content, great. Um, but that, you know, that's not really what we do, and that's not really your best sound quality option. That's just the truth. That's the facts. Not allegedly, but it is. Um, or you can take a receiver with a zone two. Many of them have amplification or assignable amps. So if you're not doing a 9.2, you know, nine channel system, you can take those amps and redirect them to a pair of outdoor speakers on the patio, which I'm telling you, having audio in different rooms is awesome. You know, mm -hmm. music like lighting and smell and color, and, and it, it all adds to your sense of well-being. And having really good sound of music um, is awesome, as long as it's simple to use. Some of the apps are okay. Again, I, I just, as an integrator, we don't use, we don't really use Zone 2 on receivers. But as a consumer, that's what you want to do. It usually works okay for you. The, the next thing would be some kind of all-in-one sound unit that would be uh, like Russ Sound is a brand that's kind of synonymous with that, or it's 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 a matrix amp and it's it's all built in, or or Martin Logan. Then add a pretty decent set of speakers. Now, in ceiling and in wall speakers, we don't do many in walls anymore, just from an aesthetics and, and coverage in a room. In ceiling speakers, one of the things that makes them good as a surround speaker is they have a very wide coverage. The, the designers of these speakers like Sonance, I mean, Origin Acoustics, Acoustics Focal, various B&W, Polk, hope I don't miss anybody, but they understand that these speakers are going to be put into a room for aesthetics, meaning you're not going to be able to position the speakers perfectly for where your seating position is, where you're going to stand. They're going to cover a big area. You might have two pair, you might have more pair, three pair. So they have a very wide coverage and very wide dispersion on them. Um, and set up and the quality varies. I mean, you can get really with a good source like Tidal or Cobuzz or a CD player, you can have really good sound quality if you use an amp like the 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 Martin Logan or some of the triad stuff now. That's really a great option. But when you get into those and you're gonna need to really realistically to add some kind of control system for it. And that's where integrators like us come in. That doesn't necessarily equate to the average person. You know, there's a lot of people just want to have distributed audio without having to hire an, an integrator to do that, then a zone two really is a great option to do that. So not to get too far off topic, but how often, I was kind of worried about, wondering about this, how often do you uh, integrate invisible speakers, the ones that are like a part of the drywall? And you, and yeah, like, yeah, that's a good question. Well, there's some really- Stealth um, acoustics, for example. Yeah, stealth acoustics. Um, in fact, Sonance just came out with a the, a brand new series of, of, of invisible speakers. We use them sometimes. They didn't really sound all that great for a while. They're just, they're really cool. I mean, they're literally. Inefficient. Well, they're inefficient. You need a ton of power. So in the, the, I just, I'm working on a $9 million house now. And one of the things we did is we had to have invisible speakers in all these various main areas of the house. And we did, and they're drywalled. I mean, they basically, you put the speaker in, um, then they drywall around it, and then they mud it and they finish it. And you, you can't tell that it's there. On these particular speakers, they were Sonance, 
I actually used um, on the receiver has pre outs. So for the, I use them as rear speakers, which is not ideal, but that's what the project called for because it's a very chic high end installation. So I'm actually using Sonance amps with DSP built into them from the pre outs of the receiver. The receiver is going to power the front. Those are those are going to power the 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 invisible speakers, and because they have DSPs that actually in, enhance and work to make those sound better. They're cool. I mean, if they're not an necessarily an audiophile product, but for surrounds or just background music in a room, they work great. Yeah. So why don't we talk about, um, I don't do a lot of coverage on audio Hawks about this, but what about 70 volt audio? That's kind of like another, there's advantages, there's disadvantages. Right. Why don't we define and talk about what that sure. is? And I'll so basically, you know, when you're, when you're dealing with conventional speakers, you, you impedance is everything. You know, if you run them in series, you run them in parallel, depending on how many speakers you have. 70 volt is a is a constant power setup, constant voltage. So with a 70 volt system, now you're going to find this in schools, hospitals, malls, parking garages, any area where you need to have a lot of speakers for sound reinforcement. Sound reinforcement is using multiple speakers distributed and deployed in such a way that you have a low, consistent, good quality sound in an area. 70 volt allows you to add five speakers, seven speakers, 10 speakers, 50 speakers, depending on, on how powerful your amplifier is. Um, if you use a conventional speaker, uh, then you have to add you know, a, a device to that to make it work. Um, but most 70 volt speakers have what's called taps on them. And those taps can be set at 10 watts. They can be set at 15 watts, 20, 30, depending on how the speaker is designed. So, for instance, if you had um, 10 speakers and you had a 120 watt 70 volt amplifier, you would set the taps in such a way that that you almost push it to the limit of that, but you back it off a little bit. So you're not you're not maxing it out. We use 70 volt systems when we like, like we do a lot of apartment complexes um, where we'll have, you know, six, seven, 10 speakers in a zone and in a channel of 70 volt amplification on that. We use it. We usually use like a, a matrix like the triad as a source. We don't add volume controls to them because it's just kind of out of vogue. Nobody really uses volume controls much anymore. But 70 volt expands on your ability. And it's also very long range. You can run 70 volt hundreds of yards and still play this, the speakers and still get a decent sound of it. But it's a, it's usually a mono sound. Yeah. Uh, on, as a rule, it doesn't have to be, but usually it's mono and it's just designed to cover a large area. So, so part of the reason why you could run these long runs is you're converting that that high amperage output of a of a speaker output mm -hmm. of an amplifier. You're running it through a transformer, and it's becoming a high impedance, which is basically turning it into voltage, which you can carry across longer distances without right. I squared R losses. Right. Yeah, you yeah. could add a transformer to a conventional speaker. But most of the commercial speakers are designed with back boxes. Or, you know, they're designed for a commercial environment where you have uh, plenums, you have drop ceilings, they have fire rated uh, enclosures that they have. You know, we do a lot of um, landscape speakers around pools where we do right. the omnidirectional. We'll do rocks sometimes. One of the speaker systems that we we do a lot of now are the the Sonance outdoor landscape system or the Klipsch outdoor landscape system. And they have, they're, they're kind of a, a all in one box. So you, a lot of times you'll have eight satellite speakers that are small, that look like landscape lighting, a subwoofer that usually buries in the ground, whether it be an eight, 10, 12 or 15, and then an amplifier to push it. A lot of those have the option to either run it at, in eight ohms or, or run in a, as a 70 volt system. More often than not, we use it strictly as a 70 volt system because of the distances involved in it. A lot of times we have to go from a rack down into the pool area, into conduit out and cover a pool or a, a yard or a large area. In fact, I've got a, a schematic drawing on there. If you want to take a look at it, it looks like a pool or a yard. Um, you pull that up and that shows kind of how they work. And That's we'll it. run these speakers around the perimeter of an area and add a subwoofer, even though they're not stereo more often than not, it still sounds really good. I mean, it, it's great. See that looks like the green, yeah, that one. Yep. Yep. So that kind of illustrates a little bit. You see where the blue, the speakers have their coverage and you see multiple satellites kind of ran around an area. And what that does is again, sound reinforcement that gives you a really good um, sound quality 
consistent wherever you're at. So if you get up, you're laying out, it sounds good. If you want to go over around a pool, around another area, if you want to have a conversation, have a drink with somebody, it, it makes it very enjoyable. Mm -hmm. If you take, if you try to do, accomplish the same thing with two or four, maybe even six speakers, you know, it would be really loud in some areas and it would be really quiet in other areas. And you would see, actually see people congregate subconsciously to the quieter areas so they could have a conversation. This has kind of solved all that I'm telling you, man. These, the, when, and you'll see on your new smart house, you haven't really had a chance to experience you, these yet. They're really, really great. See, yeah. Jonathan snap has some 70 volt. Yeah. Snap has um, quite a bit of 70 volt stuff. Um, in fact, we're using some of the snap 70 volt amps now. Um, because they're oversea enabled and oversee another conversation. It's a ecosystem that they have in multiple products. Yeah. So, so, the, so the clip system that we're going to be using in the audio smart house, that's 70 volt. Well, it's, it's either or. So the clips amplifiers, um, the 500 and 1000 are really great. They're class H, but they're, they're they have, they're, they're all done digitally online. They have, and they have, um, DSPs specifically for Klipsch model speakers, but mm -hmm. those amps are flexible enough to work as an eight ohm amp and they're stable down the two ohms, I believe, or work as a 70 volt amp. So, but when 70, it's a, they're both four channel and 70 volt, you have to combine two channels from each side. So it's only a two channel amp and 70 volt. I'll tell you later why I know that, <laughs> but no. they're, they make them in a 500 watt or a thousand watt there. There's a lot of great products out there. 70 volt, is a great solution if you want to cover a large area. Most homeowners don't need 70 volt. It's it just it's really hard to get the same kind of sound quality out of a 70 volt system. We've done some really high end commercial installations. We did one down in the Sarasota area where we used a really large their Klipsch in ceiling commercial eight inch speakers. Now it's an eight inch speaker, but the, the 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 actual enclosure is much much larger, and with enough power, they'll play like 120 dBs. But those sound okay. But you're just never going to get the sound, and and it's not really that important. I mean, in a commercial installation and application, it's it's more of a background music thing. Okay, so two questions I have for you: 70 volt is typically mono, right? Because you're distributing audio throughout a whole large typically, area. Typically. Mm -hmm. So that leads me to my next question. If you're not doing 70 volt and you're setting up audio in a pool and you want speakers all around, sure. typically I think it's probably you want to do those mono as well, right? You don't always want to do stereo. Well, I mean, we always try to do stereo. You just got to do the, the calculation and you got to, you know, wire them in parallel and, you know, you just have to have enough amplification to cover them. So let me give you an example of that. Say you had a pool and you wanted to do, um, it's one zone, but you wanted to do six pair of speakers to get that for coverage mm -hmm. or eight pair. So if you did eight pair, you could take two pair, wire them in series, I believe, and, and run that back. One amplifier would run those and do the same on the other two pair. And it would drop it to four ohms, which most of these amps are, are usually stable at four ohms, but have the same source run to it. So it's one zone with two amplifiers run it. Now you could repeat that to 20 amps if you wanted to. So that's one way to do it. It's just distance, Gene. It's, it's, you know, 14 gauge speaker cable, 16 gauge more often than not. Um, the power of the amplifier, you know, spread out and it's 300 feet or whatever amount. You know, you're just, it's just the mechanics of it. We usually don't run 12 gauge speaker cable or 10 gauge to outdoor speaker systems because nobody wants to pay for that. You know, and that's what you would need. So speaker cable is a funny thing. At shorter distances, a smaller speaker cable, you back me up, Gene, is not as critical. But the longer distance you go, it's like a, oh, a yeah. water pipe you want a thicker water pipe so you get more flow and you get less you know uh loss on that and that's kind of the same thing with speaker wire yeah in fact i i did an article on speaker cable gauge versus losses what you know what gauge you need based on the amount of feed and i based that all on less than a half a db of attenuation at 20 right. kilohertz so um there is one question that came up here related is it's weird people are talking about a yamaha rx v1 i don't know why this is such a hot topic today but there's like real like 50 posts on it i'm not gonna go over amp, i love that amp man yeah, I did, it, I it did, but that, that actually that amp did have a couple that of problems amp. with it it, it, it oh, had problems yeah. with, with the preamp output couplers on it i remember years ago they would go bad but anyways i love yamaha i know the whole history of all their receivers so, so jonathan we always run 14 gauge for 14.4 or 14.2? 14.4, usually on our outdoor. Yeah. 
long distance. So 14-4 costs more than 12-2. I mean, you were saying that people don't want to run 12-2 well, because of the well, we don't We don't combine the wires like that. We, we usually have – we'll split oh, it. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, again, it's background music. It works fine. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I got gotcha. you. We, we, in fact, the, the higher-end installations that we do, most commercial companies, man, they, they just slap in whatever – we 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 come from a high end home EV audio file background in our company that we so we we try to do a little bit better product and they've everybody's absolutely loved the sound quality that that on the commercial systems that we've done. So when you run speaker cable, you don't you don't ever run copper clad aluminum. You always run pure copper, right? Yeah, we we always use high quality speaker cable, um, high quality RG six even high, high quality Cat six. We mm -hmm. we we pride ourselves on we don't skimp on cable we don't just buy it from the cheapest we buy it from the same manufacturer we, we like consistency and as you saw the color coding that we do on everything yep yep actually we have a video on that i don't know if we i don't think i published it yet but we talked no, about yeah on the smart home the structured wiring yeah i just want everybody to know distributed audio is really great to have it's something that enhances your life it doesn't have to be overly complex if you're running i think most of these receivers are pretty potent to have the zone two and zone three. If you assign amplifiers from them, more often than not, you can easily run two pair of speakers wired properly on that same channel of amplification coming back and still get really good sound quality. So where do yeah. you where do you where do you think this is heading in the next decade? Like uh, all right, I know this is kind of hard to think of, but 10 years ago we never thought we'd see the day we never thought 10 years ago that we were going to be able to access all this stuff from our phone, use title Basically, title eliminated the need for having a CD collection. I don't. I don't remember the last time I pulled a CD out. Right, me or, I mean, and I know it goes against a lot of the home theater files. I don't even hardly watch Blu-rays anymore. I just stream it because it's convenient. You know, convenience. We're we're creatures of comfort and creatures of of, of convenience. So, you know, a lot of my clients are cutting the cable. We're streaming everything now. It, if you're an Apple family, we use Apple TV. I personally really dig the Roku, but there's multitude of other streaming products available out now. And the same with audio. I love Tidal. I mean, Cobuzz is really cool. I love that too. More often than not, just from a convenience standpoint, I listen to Tidal. I mean, I at my desk every day as I work. That's why I'm, I'm the light so washed out. So, you know, I have this big 38 inch ultra wide screen LG monitor and it's pretty bright, man. I got to put some black you know, darken up a little bit, but you know, streaming is convenience and, and, and that's what you see a lot of now. And on our distributed audio systems that we do, they're built with a control system controlling them. Clients, people say, Oh, I don't like music or whatever. Everybody likes music. Everybody loves music. The problem was in years past, people would, pay, well, they would set up and pay money to get a distributed audio system, but all right. So you got to hit button C, hold this hand up, Stick your left leg up, and, or, or or the husband got it, and his wife was calling. How the hell do you run this? I got you know birthday party going on, and it was it was complicated. It wasn't easy, and, right. that, and hence our industry was born. But it's a way easier now to stream, um, whether depending on what product you have. There's there's literally a ton of of distributed audio products out there. Like uh, James, James Loudspeaker is a company that I've always admired. And loved over the years. They're the, actually the ones just going back that invented the 70 volt satellite. They yeah. really, really did. I mean, I, one of the uh, home theater awards, the national awards that I won in 2010 was using James loudspeakers in a the theater, but they actually make some really high end, like all weather tower speakers for outside. Uh, Sonance makes their outdoor SLS system with a 15 inch sub, which we use on one of our projects with a 2,700 watt amp on it and six Damn. and a half inch ultra high output. And we use that as a, as an eight ohm setup and a, and a ultra high output, six and a half inch uh, satellites that are like 94 dBs or not, some really crazy high efficiency. So you can really get some big sound outside and, wow. and discreet, discreet. Yeah. At the same time, I need to bring you down to, c &E Marketing, which is uh, one of our distributors, they're the Sonance rep, and they actually have all this set up, and it it, it just it sounds great. Or take you one of our projects, Gene. Uh, we did an apartment complex called The Green in Lakewood Ranch near Sarasota, and we did all clip sh systems like you're getting. All, and and I'm telling you, man, they've got the three-story apartments kind of horseshoed around it. It's like a, a, a cavern, 
and we get that system cranking, it's it's kick ass. I mean, it plays really loud. I bet. So here's a good comment I wanted to share with you, and we didn't talk about this, and we should. Mm -hmm. Run conduit, right? Run conduit, yeah. Always try to run conduit, whether it be just regular PVC conduit or what we call Smurf tube, which is orange flex pipe, inch and a half, two inch. If you can run conduit, I mean, when we do our outdoor installations, we always run conduit because you never know. Somebody might be digging or something and they, they hit the conduit, they're more prone to stop than this. I mean, they certainly make wire. They make uh, direct burial cables for a multitude of applications, but we always run conduit and everything that we do and or run conduit for future applications. If you're building a house or remodeling a home, try to run conduit especially to the exterior of the house. That way you can bring that technology out. So if you want to bring it to a garage or build a shed or add outdoor Wi-Fi and want to do an access point, having that ability to bring those wires out is kind of important, especially in a two or three story home. Right. You know, that would be a good uh, video live stream. One of these weeks to do right. is just do it on a stable, creating a stable network, you know, getting a, a really rigid, rigid uh, network that works throughout the house not have any cold spots and it helps you with better streaming. So if you want to have high resolution audio streaming, you don't want the thing to be lagging and yeah. you should definitely so, do something like that. You know, there's a lot of, I mean, you know, I, I'm a home theater junkie as well as professional at it, but I, I go a lot of these different forums and, and different Facebook pages. There's some cats out there, man, that are doing some strong work. They might not be professional integrators, but they're innovative and they're doing some cool stuff and making some smart moves. But the average Joe, man, just doesn't want to get that deep into it. And, you know, we just want to present some ideas of what's available, not just talk about what we do um, necessarily in the big projects we do. But there's some really, really cool stuff going on. Distributed audio. A lot of the receivers now, Gene, will actually have a zone two HDMI. So it's mm -hmm. almost like having two. In theory, you could have two speakers and a TV and be in a room watching that. And at the same time that receivers in another room and they're watching another movie through that and you're watching two zones or so almost like a mini matrix. That's something that's really cool. I know Yamaha, I know Denon, Marantz, the major companies, uh, Integra, when they ever come back around, Onkyo, they actually offer higher end receivers that have this, um, this capability, which is really cool. Yeah. And the great thing about that is when you have a receiver that takes the digital input from the main zone and puts it into another zone, you don't have to run a separate set of analog cables. And then they also sync up the well, zones well, together. So there's no delay between them. Yeah, that's yeah. another problem. Back in the day, we didn't have that ability and you'd turn on all your zones in the house and you'd hear an echo effect because the delays weren't all in, you know, the zones weren't yeah, all in sync. There's an 800 pound gorilla. 90% of surround receivers that have zone two, if your source is HDMI, you're not going to be able to play that in the zone two. You're just not. They don't have the the D data converters. They don't spend the money to do that. So more often than what we used to do is is we would simply run RCAs or a 3.5 millimeter stereo um, or whatever to the zone two, and it would then play it. However, with the analog sunset, they saw all these different connections away. Mm -hmm. so now Apple TVs, I, I think they just have an HDMI Roku, an HDMI. That's all you got. So if you want to do that, you better have two of them. You know, if you're going to, you're going to play in the zone two. It, again, running zone two from a receiver is not ideal. I know they have it built in, you, but it's just not necessarily ideal to do that. I mean, even a lot of companies make stereo receivers or stereo receivers that are multi-zone. I think Yamaha makes some Denon where they have, multi, they have two or three zones that you could stack that on top of what you have, split a source or share a source with that or have a dedicated source to it. And that would then power and control the two and eight volume in these other rooms and, and sound pretty damn good doing it too. So that's another option out there as well. Awesome. Well, I think we've pretty much covered everything we wanted to talk about when it comes to distributed audio, unless you have anything right. else you want to add, where, where are we heading to the future? Are we going to have holodecks at some point? Well, I mean, the future is, you know, I'm a big fan of the, the show, the expanse. So, you know, you've got these displays that you throw up and, I think eventually I, the future of speakers are, are, are large, you know, uh, surface areas, you know, that look like a block of uh, something you hang on the wall that that just have full range sound. They're just capable of, you know, voice. I mean, I think that's where it's going to go. We haven't had any real 
gigantic major advancements in sound in a long time, Gene. A speaker's a speaker's a transducer's a transducer. Some are better than others, but we haven't had any kind of large surface area, no, no replacement for displacement that maybe blends into a wall that can displace sound at, at you know 30 dBs or 150 dBs. You know, that's where it's eventually going to go. But I think we're still a couple of technological leaps away from that. Well, the DSP processing has certainly gotten incredible. Oh, yeah. We get, we have a review. You and I just finished on the RBH SVTRS system that I'm yep. going to be posting yep. soon. And we talk about how the FIR filters is really magical. Ignoring. It's magical. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you can only do so much with equalization. You know, I'm a, you know, I'm big on the whole mechanics of a room, you know, mechanically mm -hmm. treating the sound. You just can't EQ or, or first reflection. You know, I don't care what anybody says or a slap echo. But yeah, they've come a long way. Arc is a great system. Diac, I mean, there's, you know, Odyssey was a, a big step forward. Yeah, so you're going to see more and more of that. I just want to get back to really good amplification. I, I want, after listening to those Class Ds with the that Pascal module in it, like RBH has and Storm Audio, I mean, I've heard some amazing, mega expensive Mark Levinson, Krell, Macintosh, you know, forgive me for, I don't say a million of them, but the list goes on. Those amps are amazing in a, in a one or two gen chassis. They just, the sound quality, the, the dynamics, you know, people associate class D with subwoofers. They just use relatively cheap class D amplifiers because they're just looking for power and SPL, yeah. those low frequencies, but amps like that, I think that's the wave. And when we can, if we can get a surround receiver that that's of a, a moderate size that legitimately has 200 watts in the eight ohms or 400 watts in the four ohms. It runs and, and sounds clean. I think class D you, you, you're able to do that or you're going to be able to do that. Well, I'll give some props out to NAD because they're one of the first that are really changing out their receiver line to go class D they've got the, I think they have the Encore um, amp module in their existing receivers, but they also just came out with a seven channel amp that uses the purify class D, which is Bruno Putzi's design. That mm -hmm. thing has a better distortion and noise profile than my audio precision. That's how good it is. And wow. that's why people, anybody that's, you know, poo poo in class D just doesn't really understand how that's evolved over the last five, yeah. 10 years. Yeah. Cla class D is the future. I, I truly believe I, I, hearing it. I mean, hearing that, you know, that super system from RBH and some of the other stuff I've heard once, once companies really pay attention to it. I mean, once and it sounds much warmer than it used to. Class D mm -hmm. used to have kind of a quasi artificial sound, kind of like a crown amp or these class H or a lot of these commercial amps that have they have a lot of power, but it's just not a warm sound, not you know. Refined, like, like, yeah. yeah, like an AB amp would have, you know, that I, I just had the uh, Parasound JC5 into my house for you know six, seven months just reviewing it. I mean, I think weighs a hundred pounds, it's a beautiful, it's a masterpiece, it's a great amp. But if I could accomplish that with an amp that hardly creates any heat that big and actually truly doubles its power, you know, that's the future. You know, that that's where we're going to go. And that's going to translate in the home theater. It's going to translate in the two channel audio, which is kind of where it all begins. And mm -hmm. it's going to translate into distributed audio. It already has. I mean, it's going to. It, is, it has. That triad amp is a killer piece. And it, that bit, it's like that big. Yep. So, yep. I mean, I know I can't. My only complaint about that amp is I can hear the fan spinning on it once it turns wow. on. But if it's in a rack in another room, it doesn't matter. But if yeah, it's most of our installations, most of the installs we do, everything's in one rack, one central location, including the surround sound stuff. Unless it's a big full tilt theater, then we'll do a sub rack so we keep, can keep that closer. But I um, mean, it's it's um that that's where it's going to go. Um, is the music sources get more and more uh, high resolution and as the the control systems get easier to use for it that's the key N all this is great and the nerd talk is great but if if your wife can't operate it or your kid or your or your mom well kids can operate anything so you can give a 12 year old kid anything he'll figure it out but that's the key is to make it easy to use if you make it simple and easy like netflix does the smart tvs did then it's going to explode because people don't want to be nerds. They just want to enjoy sound and picture. Yep. 
All right, guys. Well, I just wanted to share this picture because I'm I'm getting a little sentimental. I'm about to move, and uh, this is my existing memories. Now. Yeah, memories. I've been here for 15 years, and I'm in a couple Good. of weeks. I'm going to be out of here. I'm going to be. Buddy, out of that center channel is huge, and it, this looks like tiny compared to those. My man, I, I wish all of the people you know that follow and 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 audio hogs could spend 10 minutes listening to this system. Yeah. I have heard some mega dollar. I've sold crazy high end audio of all ki kinds over the years. And I'm telling you, I've never really heard anything that I think can match this. And it's not cheap. I mean, it's the price of a, of a really nice car, but you know, there's speakers out there that are $200,000 that this thing would smoke. I'm telling you, it's just yeah. absolute sheer power clean effortless. undistorted effort effortless like when we played that phil collins jane or you weren't there so it, uh, when i was with shane and um scott at rbh up in nashville doing that 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 audio event um we had it all set up and you know shane dialed it in and they played the phil collins in the air tonight and it goes doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo. i'm telling that. you it was just nuts oh this this you know twenty thousand square foot uh, office this company had it was just crazy and the, the guy just like that was we were demoing it to demoing the system to just looked like oh my god that it's just visceral man it's just hard to describe and wasn't transducers and it wasn't you know trickery it was this sheer perfectly eq'd perfectly executed um setup i mean what's got 412s or eight per side yeah per eight, side. 12, uh, 412s per side yeah, yeah. just no, what? No replacement for displacement. Sorry, yep. Bose. Absolutely. Allegedly. All right, guys. So we are wrapping this up. I appreciate, uh, Don, you taking the time to go over this topic on distributed audio. I hope you, guys, hope you guys found this useful. Please make sure you thumb this video up. Make sure you subscribe. A huge portion of the people that watch our channel are not subscribed, so you're not going to get right. notifications when we go live or when we have new videos coming up unless you subscribe. So hit that subscribe button right now, as Youth Man right. says. And okay. um, we've got a ton more. Uh, yeah, we haven't even scratched. We're we're we've just trimmed the um, the Autoholic Smart Home, and the racks the equipment's ordered. We're gathering the equipment. I mean. <laughs> this is like like audio nirvana in this house. I don't think people quite realize audio until we get it. it. It dude, it's like straight up. It's like porn hub for audio. It's crazy. So I, I'm excited to um, to get this going and do a multitude of videos and really give Audioholics this this thank you for building this house. But having this new updated, your room was cool in 2002. But man, I'm telling you, this is like like from the ground up built. Uh, to 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 demo new systems, demo different stuff. It, it's going to be exciting. I'm I'm excited to do it. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, that's a wrap. Don't forget about our Patreon channel at Patreon.com/slash/Audioholics. If you want to have direct access to us to ask questions, you want to get content early, or you just want to support the site and help us keep this going, because you know Don's expensive, man. He ain't cheap. Yeah, I'm expensive. Man. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a cheapo. What are you talking about? Yeah. No, well, guys, I, I dig it, man. I just listen. You know, I, I'm not, you know, super smooth like some of these cats. But if if you got questions, email me or hit, hit us up. And if I can't answer it, I'll get the answer. So, really. All right. That's a wrap. And until next time, my friends. Keep, keep listening. listening. That's right.